First off, Heaven's Gate. This infamous UFO cult believed that the Earth was about to be wiped clean and the only way to survive was to leave it. In late March 1997, as Hale Bop reached its closest distance to Earth in a haunting act of collective departure from the material world, Applewhite and his 38 devout followers consumed a deadly cocktail of phenobarbital and vodka. Their intention was to shed their earthly bodies, board an alien spacecraft, and journey through Heaven's Gate to achieve a perceived superior form of existence. The group was established in 1974 by Bonnie Nettles and Marshall Applewhite, who were referred to as T and Doe within the movement. The pair first encountered each other in 1972 and embarked on a spiritual journey claiming to be the two witnesses mentioned in Revelation. By the mid-1970s, they had amassed several hundred followers. By 1976, the movement comprising a core group of a few dozen members adopted a monastic lifestyle and ceased recruitment. This is dark, but now I'm curious. Have you stumbled upon a story about a UFO cult that sent chills down your spine and left your palms sweating? Share your eeriest encounter in the comments. Heaven's Gates theology is perceived as a fusion of Christian millenarianism, a new age philosophy, and ufology leading to its recognition as a UFO religion. The group held a firm belief that members could morph into immortal extraterrestrial beings by renouncing their human nature, and that they would ascend to a higher existence termed as the next level or the evolutionary level above human. After Nettles succumbed to cancer in 1985, the group reinterpreted their belief in ascension. Initially, they thought they would ascend to heaven alive via a UFO, but later they began to view the body as merely a vessel for the soul and believed their consciousness would transition to next level bodies upon passing. On March 26, 1997, the San Diego County Sheriff's Department found the bodies of the 39 active members of the group, including Applewhite, in a house in the San Diego suburb of Rancho Santa Fe. Just prior to the mass departure, after the group's website was updated with a message indicating that the comet marked the end of Heaven's Gate's journey on Earth and they were ready to leave with T's crew. However, the name Heaven's Gate was only used in the final years of the group's existence. Previously, they were known as Human Individual Metamorphosis and Total Overcomers Anonymous. Despite the horrific tragedy that occurred with the Heaven's Gate cult, it continues to intrigue and fascinate many people even years later. The beliefs and actions of this group offer a glimpse into the complexities of human behavior and our search for meaning and purpose in life. One of the most striking aspects of the Heaven's Gate cult is their unwavering faith in their leader, Marshall Applewhite. He was able to convince his followers that their wiping out from existence was the only way to reach a higher level of existence and achieve salvation. This blind faith serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of giving total control over one's life to another person. The constant bombardment of doomsday predictions and conspiracy theories in mainstream media has made people more susceptible to believing in extreme ideas. The fear of the unknown and the desire for answers often lead individuals to seek solace in these groups, providing them with a sense of belonging and purpose. However, the danger lies in the potential for manipulation and exploitation by leaders of those groups. The blind loyalty and willingness to believe can be used to control and manipulate followers for personal gain. This is why it's crucial to approach such groups with caution and critical thinking. Next on our list, the Aetherius Society. Founded in 1954 by George King, this group believes in advanced extraterrestrial intelligences operating on spiritual principles who govern the Earth. They consider themselves as cooperators with these cosmic beings to bring about positive change. The unique spiritual group founded by a man who claimed to communicate with the extraterrestrial beings whom he called the Cosmic Masters. Followers of this faith believe that by aligning with these Cosmic Masters, they can help humanity overcome earthly challenges and ascend to a new age. Their belief system is a complex mix of theosophy, new age notions, millenarian beliefs, and elements of UFO mythology. This society highly values selflessness, community service, respect for nature, spiritual healing, and fitness. Their gatherings resemble traditional church services. Although the Aetherius society is generally non-controversial, some have questioned its esoteric and millenarian aspects. Despite its followers spanning the globe, the society remains quite small, with membership mainly concentrated in the UK, Southern California, the US, and New Zealand. Their theology, deeply influenced by theosophy, fuses narratives of UFOs, yoga, and elements from different world religions, especially Hinduism, Buddhism, and Christianity. They reject religious exclusivity, maintaining that no one religion, nation, or race holds a monopoly of, on divine favor. The ultimate goal of this religion is to prevent global destruction by promoting harmony between humans and extraterrestrial masters, and 
and by harnessing spiritual energy to raise the planet's spiritual level. They believe that prayer, often associated by spiritual energy batteries, often assisted by spiritual energy batteries, designed to hold healing psychic energy can prevent or mitigate various disasters. The society's founder claimed to have telepathic conversations with Aetherius, placing him in the esteemed company of other Venus-sourced cosmic masters like Buddha and Jesus. Next up on our list is Christ Brotherhood. This group's intense devotion to otherworldly powers and alleged plans to summon extraterrestrial beings have made them a group of interest to the government. The unique UFO religion born out of Orange, California, it all started back in 1956 when a man named Wallace C. Halsey received otherworldly messages in his dreams. These prophetic warnings from alien beings detailed the looming end of the world, but with a silver lining chosen few of humanity would be saved. Halsey established Christ Brotherhood Inc. as a non-profit religious educational organization. Its mission, enlightening mankind. Remarkably, it attracted members from a staggering 52 different religious denominations. In a compelling turn of events, Halsey led his followers to Cache Valley, Utah in 1961. Here they started building a unique compound replete with underground weapon shelters in the mountains near Smithfield City. Why this location, you ask? Well, Joseph Smith, the founding prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints had identified the Rocky Mountains as a sanctuary. But in 1963, the coherence of the Brotherhood was tested when Halsey mysteriously disappeared during a flight from Utah to Nevada. Despite exhaustive searches and even attempts to call upon extraterrestrial assistance, it took 13 years for a lost deer hunter to inadvertently discover the plane wreckage and the remains of Halsey and pilot Harry Cleveland Ross Jr. In memory of Halsey, his teachings to the Brotherhood were compiled into a volume published in 1965 caused Cosmic End Time Secrets. This book encapsulates the prophetic messages from alien life forms to Halsey, but this was not the end of the Christ Brotherhood. In fact, it continued to attract followers, with more than 100 members in 1979 and a peak of around 500 in the early 1980s. The teachings of the Christ Brotherhood continue to fascinate people even today, with many still searching for answers about their beliefs and practices. One notable aspect of the Brotherhood is their strong belief in the existence of extraterrestrial beings and their role in humanity's future. They also have a unique interpretation of the Bible incorporating elements of ufology and ancient astronaut theories. On to the next, the Raelian Movement. Often termed as the most significant UFO cult, boasts a global following of around 80,000 enthusiasts, a tale that spins around the message, a belief that all life forms, yeah, all races and species, are the brainchild of the extraterrestrial assistance named the Elohim. These entities, they claim, used DNA to breathe life into the previously barren Earth. They advocate for world peace, share democracy and nonviolence. Particularly in focus today is the French sector of the movement, Mouvement Rallier Francais, or the MRF, which has faced its fair share of backlash and criticism. In fact, within France, it's frequently labeled as a harmful cult. But here's where the story gets interesting. Despite the criticism and the anti-cult sentiment, the movement has managed to survive and even thrive since its inception in the early 70s. Their leader, the self-proclaimed Messiah Raël, was ousted from France in 2002 and has hasn't returned since. The tale of Rael's exile, the French Raelian's resilience in the face of anti-cult biases, and the recent strategy to dissolve their formal organization for a more clandestine operation provide a captivating peek into the influence of the anti-cult movement on targeted groups within France. It's evident that the Raelian movement has faced its fair share of challenges, but their unwavering belief in the message and their desire to spread it globally is a testament to their resilience. Whether you believe in extraterrestrial origins or not, you can't deny the influence this movement has on popular culture and the ongoing conversation about the existence of alien life. Ever heard of Bohemian Grove? A secretive organization of people that control the world? Well, what do you know? It exists, and many of its members are powerful world leaders and titans of industry. It appears to primarily exist as a place where the rich and powerful go to misbehave. That is, according to the Washington Post. Technically speaking, Bohemian Grove is a restricted 2,700-acre campground at 2601 Bohemian Avenue in Monte Rio, California, in the States, belonging to a private San Francisco-based gentleman's club known as the Bohemian Club. In mid-July of every year, they host a more than two-week encampment of some of the most prominent men in the world. Their all-male membership includes artists and musicians, as well as many prominent business leaders, government officials, former U.S. presidents, senior media executives, people of power. You'll notice that I'm not saying any specific names right now, and that's because I don't feel like getting sued or disappearing. 
Thanks. Members can invite guests for either the Spring Jinx in June or the Main July encampments, or they can schedule private day use events when things aren't being used for club wide purposes, and that's when you're allowed to bring spouses, family, and friends. But if you're a gal or you're underage, Got to get out of there by 9 or 10 o'clock at night because that's when things get fun apparently. After 40 years of membership, that's when a guy earns the old guard status. Gives you reserved seating at the daily talks and other perks. Okay, I think there's a couple of names I can talk about without getting in trouble. Pray for me. Former US President Herbert Hoover was inducted into the Old Guard on March 4th of 1953, and the club motto is Weaving Spiders Come Not Here, which implies that outside concerns and business deals are left outside. But a lot of business deals actually occur here. Important political and business deals have been developed, notably a Manhattan Project planning meeting that took there in September of 1942, subsequently leading to the atomic explosive device. Those attending this meeting? Ernest Lawrence, J. Robert Oppenheimer, the S1 executive committee heads, presidents of Harvard, Yale, Princeton, along with representatives of Standard Oil and General Electric and military officials. At the time, Oppenheimer was not an S1 member, but he hosted the meeting. Grove members take particular pride in this event, and they tell the story pretty often, so I think I was safe to talk about that. Other behavior at the campground has led to numerous claims, with President Richard Nixon's comments from May 13th of 71, calling it the most, insert F word slur for gay here, goddamn thing you could ever imagine. I swear finding a way to say curse words without getting dinged by YouTube rules is like writing a crossword puzzle. Oh, to be a fly on the wall of any of those meetings. Sounds like a cult to me. Okay. Here's a cult I know you've seen posters for, Shen Yun. Technically, it's a show put on by a religious group that is arguably a cult called the Falun Gong. This was founded by a man named Li Hongzi, who registered the group with the Chinese government in 92. Uh, fun fact, in 1989, after the bad protests, the Chinese Communist Party established a registry of social organizations to try and solve things. Li has been open about his beliefs that evolution is fraudulent, that people of different races will be separated in heaven, and that homosexuality and promiscuity are unnatural. Great, I'm in trouble. He's mentioned that he believes that aliens were attempting to control humans by making us dependent on modern science. Okay. A San Francisco man named Samuel Luo has claimed his mother and stepfather refused essential medical treatment because of the teachings, saying that sickness is based in karma. Also, apparently it's God's plan to eliminate the gay population. Well, I'm still here. So, Shen Yun was kicked out of China and have some heavy anti-communist sentiments to say the least. Essentially, they're a church that is putting all of their money into a dance show with very heavy anti-communism and anti-China sentiments. They don't hide that they're heavily critical of the government of China. In between depictions of ancient dances or stories told through dance and singing, there are skits depicting, get this, organ harvesting, kidnapping, and suppression of religious liberty by plainclothes secret police. That's a heck of a show. A memo from the Embassy of the People's Republic of China has quite the opinion on the performances. Allow me to quote. This organization preaches heretical fallacies that are anti-humanity and anti-science, and exercises extreme mental manipulation on followers. It is a cult that seriously harms a society and violates human rights, and is a cancer in the body of the modern and civilized society. According to one attendee over the last couple of years, at one point during the show, an amazing singer came on stage for a solo performance, and then the lyrics of the songs were translated and written on a screen, and they included things like, oh boy, atheism and evolution are deadly ideas. And modern trends destroy what makes us human. That wasn't just something that was said once, it was a recurring theme. This group also concludes the show with a tidal wave crashing into mainland China as a result of their anti religious ways, in typical end of days fashion. This company has eight total groups that tour for six months each year, performing in over 130 cities in North America, Europe, Asia, Australia, and Latin America. Ergo, trying to control the world through their views. Okay, here's an out there idea Rasputin's followers. Hear me out for a minute, would ya? Grigory Rasputin, the legendary Russian mystic and healer, developed a devoted following during his time in St. Petersburg, particularly into the early 20th century. While it might be a stretch to label it a cult in the traditional sense, he did attract a group of followers who revered him as a holy man with supernatural powers. His rise to prominence began when he arrived in St. Petersburg in the early 1900s, claiming to possess healing abilities and a direct connection to God. His charismatic personality and rumored ability to cure Alexei, the hemophilia son of the Tsar Nicholas II and Empress Alexandra gained him favor within the Russian imperial family, mostly Alexandria, but still, that was plenty for the time. His influence then extended beyond the royal court, as he attracted followers among the Russian nobility, clergy, and common people. A lot of folks believed that he possessed mystical powers, including the ability to predict the future and influence political decisions. 
Sounds like a cult taking over something to me. Some folks even credited him with supernatural abilities such as mind control and hypnotism. Once again, we're checking off all the boxes. Rasputin's followers formed a kind of informal cult around him, gathering at his home, seeking his guidance on matters of faith, healing, and personal advice. They saw him as a holy man, capable of performing miracles and offering spiritual enlightenment. Granted, his reputation wasn't without controversy. His unorthodox behavior, including his heavy drinking, promiscuity, and rumored involvement in dark and depraved activities led to a lot of speculation and condemning from both the Russian Orthodox Church and a lot of Russian society. The man liked to have coitus, and he liked to have it with his followers. Now, despite the criticism and opposition he faced, his hold over the imperial family remained strong for quite some time, because Empress Alexandra relied on him for advice and support. Granted, his influence ultimately became a liability for the monarchy, contributing to growing resentment and discontent amongst the Russian people. So what happened? Well, in December of 1916, a group of nobles, alarmed by his influence and concerned about the state of the monarchy, were like, hmm, let's assassinate him. How'd they do it? Well, they poisoned him, they fired at him, and they drowned him. I don't have enough time to go into detail, but rest assured, if it takes that much to kill somebody, they're not human like you or I. While his followers might not fit the traditional definition of a cult, their unwavering devotion to him and belief in his supernatural powers played a significant role in shaping his legacy as one of the most mysterious and controversial figures in Russian history. Also, his control over the monarchy. Come on. Look, I had to say Scientology today or else everybody would be asking me about it. This is a set of beliefs and practices invented by the American author L. Ron Hubbard, who developed a set of ideas that he called Dianetics. He presented it as a form of therapy. By 1954, he founded the Church of Scientology, and current estimates put the number of Scientologists, or followers, at just under 40,000 worldwide. That's a lot of folks. Scientology beliefs include reincarnation, and that traumatic events cause problematic engrams in the mind. But hey, it can be fixed. It's a process called auditing. But you gotta pay a fee each time. Eventually, somebody's gonna be like, okay, you're good. It takes about seven years. Then you're given the status of clear. After you're deemed clear, then you can take part in further activities called operating thetan levels, which, you guessed it, more money. The texts are kept secret from most followers and revealed only after you've given hundreds of thousands of dollars to the organization. If you don't have ridiculous amounts of money to burn, don't worry. Go on WikiLeaks, they're there. From soon after their formation, these groups have generated considerable opposition and controversy. And that's because, well, there's been some illegalness. So, by 1967, Hubbard was like, ooh, I'm gonna form a new elite group, the Sea Organization, or Sea Org, and I'm only gonna pick the most committed members of the church to join. By 1981, we get David Miscavige, who had been one of Hubbard's closest aides. He rose to prominence, so when Hubbard passed away, Miscavige was like, I'm in charge now and he's still in charge to this day. Look, that's 1986 to 2024. You do the math, it's been a minute. If you wanna talk about the illegal stuff, well, in the 1970s, all of these followers engaged in a program of criminal infiltration of the US government, resulting in several executives of the organization being convicted and imprisoned for multiple offenses by a US federal court. Well, going back to the former leader, Hubbard, he was convicted in absentia of fraud by a French court in 1978 and sentenced to four years in prison. In 1992, a court in Canada convicted the Scientology organization in Toronto of spying on law enforcement and government agencies, and also criminal breach of trust. The Church of Scientology was convicted of fraud by a French court in 2009, a judgment which was upheld by the Supreme Court of Cessation in 2013. The Church of Scientology has been described by government inquiries, international parliamentary bodies, scholars, law lords, and numerous superior court judgments as both a dangerous cult and a manipulative profit-making business. I could talk about them for hours. We could be here all day. And just how awful they are. So let me know in the comments if you'd want that. How about we end today with a doozy that I think still controls a lot of people, but they don't know it, Nick Zeum. Founder Keith Rainier originally promoted this as a self-help organization. There was workshops, there was classes on empowerment. Heck yes, it had 18,000 followers at its peak. I think that was around 2017 when members came forward to expose the really bad practices of a secret society within the group. Women were recruited under the false pretense that they were joining a sisterhood, but it ended up being a coitus cult. There was a pyramid scheme, so Keith, who members would call Vanguard, he was at the top, followed by masters who recruited other women to join the secretive group. And at the bottom were the newest recruits, who were referred to as, well, the lowest of the low. A former member explained that in order to be admitted to the secret club, you gotta hand over some dirt, some nudie photos and other compromising documents that people could use to blackmail you with if you ever tell anybody about it. She was also told that another part of the initiation was getting a small tattoo. But when the day arrived, well, um, 
She got branded instead. No little tattoo, a brand. Where was it? Right above the pelvic area. Each woman was instructed to say, and I quote, Master, please brand me. It would be an honor. Yeah. Icky. So fast forward to 2020, Keith was tried in court when more than a dozen women came forward with statements regarding his psychological and other icky misdoings. He was convicted of many crimes, racketeering, bad videos, I could go on. He was sentenced to life in prison, but in a court filing, his lawyers wrote, yeah, he's not sorry for his choices. Look, if you're handing over that much blackmail, I'm pretty sure this cult still exists to this day, but people just don't want to come forward. I don't blame them, but eh. How about we start off today with a UFO cult, known as the Superior Universal Alignment. Also known as, wait for it, Lanamiento Universal Superior, it was founded by Valentina de Andrade in 1981. She claimed to have received messages from extraterrestrials warning her of destruction. If, however, she shared their warnings with others, she and her followers would be saved. Similar to the Raelians, SUA believes that Jesus was actually an extraterrestrial messenger. They also believe that males born after 1981 are evil and that their lives should end as payment to the superior beings. In 1989, the Amazonian town of Altamira received a sudden increase in reports of missing boys. Not having clear clues about the disappearances, the authorities couldn't do anything about it. By 1993, the reports rose to 19 missing young folks with no trace or clue as to find them. By that time, the bodies of five of the missing were found dead with signs of torment and castration, and it was determined that these killings were connected to the medical guild because the castration seemed to be made by a medical expert. But other than that, nobody knew anything and there was no evidence. So the authorities opened an investigation and began to connect the dots between the killings and those who were missing. The bodies of the boys were identified as homeless ones who had worked in the streets, but most of the missing ones had been reported by their families. This fact unsettled and confused the detectives in charge of the investigation, and uh, they were like, okay, both cases can't be related, because who's so depraved? Well, all their efforts weren't really doing much until one day. One boy came to them and was like, hey, I escaped from my captors, let me tell you everything. The brutality described seemed as if it was ripped from the pages of a horror novel. Some of the atrocities that he suffered that I can say included the castration, obviously, and mutilation, everything else I can't say. He also explained that other victims were impaled to death and their organs were extracted and sold to the black market. Some unofficial versions state that the captors even ate the organs, but there's no official confirmation on that front. Brazilian society was shocked when the victim identified those in charge, since a lot of the folks identified were respected members of society. We're talking two doctors, a wealthy businessman, a police officer, and Valentina de Andrade. The leader of the group managed to escape from justice when she presented a very convincing alibi, stating that she wasn't in town when the killings took place. She was exonerated, and now she's happily guiding her increasing flock of followers who simply ignore these crimes. Great. Good leader. Moving on to the Nuobian Nation, which was a black supremacist cult, but instead of enacting a race war, its leader, Dwight York, mostly used it to amass a stable of young body selling service type SLAVES. So York began founding several black Muslim groups back in New York in 1967 and changed his teachings and names of his groups many times, incorporating concepts from Judaism, Christianity, UFO religions, New Age, and many esoteric beliefs. Essentially, whatever pieces of other religions that fit his quote-unquote vision, he used, building quite the mosaic. In the late 1980s, he abandoned the black Muslim theology of his movement in favor of Kemetism and UFO religion. In 1991, he took his community to settle in upstate New York and then near to Eatontown, the county seat of Putnam County in Georgia. His followers built an ancient Egypt-themed compound called Tamare and changed their name to the United Nuobian Nation of Moors. York published around 450 booklets under numerous pseudonyms, by the way. During the late 1990s, he styled himself a messiah founder prophet type of his own movement, sometimes claiming divine status or extraterrestrial origin when appearing on his Savior's Day celebrations at Tamare. Are you still following me? Well, because we're far from done. By the year 2000, the United Nuobian Nation of Moors had around 500 followers. Granted, they did draw thousands of visitors for Savior's Day ceremonies. Now, the followers kind of declined steeply after York was convicted of numerous counts of bad touching young people, racketeering and financial reporting violations, and sentenced to 135 years in federal prison in April of 04. The compound was sold under government forfeiture and demolished, and the Southern Poverty Law Center officially designated this group as a hate group. The group has taken taken numerous names though throughout its history, including, let's see if I can get this right, Ansaru Allah Community, Holy Tabernacle Ministries, Yamase Native American Moors of the Creek Nation, which was also used in Georgia when New York claimed indigenous ancestry via Egyptian migration and intermarriage with the ancient Olmec, and we've already talked about Nuobian Nation of Moors. 
By the way, York is still in prison for, like, bad things, but his followers have continued popping up over the years, mostly after they do crimes. Great. As of 2010, some factions of the subculture in the United States appear to continue to support York, portraying his conviction as a conspiracy by the white power structure. Malik Zulu Shabazz, chairman of the new Black Panther Party and York's lawyer, described him as a great leader of our people and a victim of an open conspiracy by our enemy. So make of that what you will. Next up, we have Providence, which is officially known as Christian Gospel Mission, CGM, Jesus Morningstar, or JMS. Geez, a lot of these things have a lot of names. It's a Christian new religious movement founded by Jung Myung Suk in 1980 and headquartered in Wo Myung Dong, South Korea. I swear I looked up how to pronounce it, folks. It's been widely referenced by international media as a cult, and you're about to find out why. So in the 1970s, this leader was a member of the Unification Church, or UC, which he based his teaching on. When he founded his own group in the 80s, it criticized Christian teachings and beliefs and maintained that their leader was the second coming of Jesus Christ and was later expelled from the Methodists. The name was changed to the International Christian Association in the mid-1980s, and a rift occurred in the group in 1986 when the vice president of Providence attempted to act on the scandal surrounding the group. But he was shut out of the organizational system, and Jung consolidated all the power around himself. In October of 1999 was when the organization officially became Christian Gospel Mission. So what were the lessons of this cult? Alrighty, everybody, buckle in. One lesson implies that those who do not meet the leader will not go to heaven. Another is that anybody who's going to betray the leader, you're committing a grave crime. During the instruction of the advanced level of the 30 lessons, it is taught that your leader is the Messiah, proven through the numerological interpretation of prophecy dates and times in the book of Daniel. Providence preaches the advent of the Complete Testament era and allegorizes the relationship between God and man to that between the groom and bride, or two lovers. It also teaches that the original sin was caused by Eve's intercourse with the fallen angel, who turned into Satan. And Providence teaches that this can be redeemed by having intercourse with your leader. Oh yeah, oh, forgot that little thing. The leader of all this was found to have forced female followers to have coitus with them as a religious behavior meant to save their souls in the Korean court of law. Former members have stated or testified that young and attractive women were presented to their leader as gifts, with whom he coercively engaged in icky acts, which was explained to them as a purification rite. So in April of 2009, our crazy leader was convicted of harming someone in the R-word way by the Supreme Court of Korea and sentenced to only 10 years of imprisonment. He was released in February of 2018, and following his release from prison, the Korea Post reported that the Providence Faith Movement had reached more than 70 countries. Before I get sick, we're moving on to the Nation of Yahweh. In 1978, Hulan Mitchell Jr. left the Nation of Islam because it just wasn't extreme enough for him. He rechristened himself Yahweh Ben Yahweh and founded the Nation of Yahweh. Try saying that five times fast. The group is classified as another black supremacist cult by the Southern Poverty Law Center and as an official cult by the Miami Herald. Swell. The SPLC has criticized the beliefs of the Nation of Yahweh as racist, stating that the group believes that black people are the true race and that whites hold wicked powers. They've apparently calmed down a bit in recent years, but the belief still seems to hold. The SPLC also claims that the group believes that Yahweh Ben Yahweh had a mission to vanquish whites and that it held views similar to those of the Christian identity movement, which believes that Aryans are the true bad guys and not whites are devils. It got to the point where Yahweh proved so popular that he got his own day in Miami, but then he started commanding his followers to kill for him, went to prison for a conspiracy to commit killings, and died shortly after his release. He still has a handful of followers in Miami though, although their activity seems to be mostly limited to like, Yahweh's the best, and posting memes about bad things, and homophobic scourges on their Facebook page. The group is reportedly spread throughout the US and no longer concentrated in one location. More recently, the group appeared in the news back in 2012 after Michael the Black Man, real name Maurice Woodside, a member of the group who is now a conservative activist, was invited to speak at a rally for Rick Santorum's presidential campaign, during which he said that Democrats were similar to Yahtzees. Woodside has since become a vocal supporter of Donald Trump, but continues to defend Yahweh Ben Yahweh and the nation's beliefs. Alrighty everybody, we're going to end today with the 12 tribes, formerly known as the Vine Christian Community Church, the Northeast Kingdom Community Church, the Messianic Communities, and the Community Apostolic Order. They're a new 
religious movement founded by Gene Spriggs that sprang out of the Jesus Movement in 1972 in Chattanooga, Tennessee. The group calls itself an attempt to recreate the first century church as it is described in the Book of Acts. The group's origins in Chattanooga led to planted churches in surrounded areas, and in the late 70s, the group began a community in Island Pond, Vermont. As the relationship with the Chattanooga community deteriorated, the group eventually left Tennessee and Vermont became the main area. So the 12 tribes' beliefs resemble those of Christian fundamentalism, the Hebrew Roots Movement, Messianic Judaism, and the Sacred Name Movement. However, the group believes that all other denominations are fallen, and it therefore refuses to align itself with any denomination or movement. The group has very strict courtship rules, and their views on raising young humans have been a source of controversy. The group supports itself through the operation of several businesses, most of which revolve around agriculture, as well as cafes, restaurants, all using unpaid and often young labor. Oh yeah, young people have been noted to play a central role in the group's beliefs, especially the sons. The 12 tribes believe that it is the parents' responsibility to properly enforce a consequence for sin, so as to allow young people to maintain the state of a clean conscience. So over time, future generations will be better equipped to deal with or overcome the faults of their predecessors. This will apparently enable future generations of the group to hopefully be the 144,000 of Revelation 7. If it wasn't already obvious, folks here are homeschooled and within the group, young people are apprenticed to elders by the age of to be trained in crafts and specialized labor. The group acknowledges using corporal punishment with a reed-like rod, like a balloon stick, across the rear end, and many former members say punishments can include severe repetitions to the point of fluid release or collapse, and are often repeated daily. The group has obviously ignited controversy and garnered unfavorable attention regarding their practices and accusations of harm. They have been criticized for their beliefs and practices, including for their supremacist views towards black and Jewish people outside of their membership. The group's teachings have been characterized as racist, misogynistic, and homophobic. NX members report excessive corporal punishment, failure to stop harm, and exploitation of followers for labor. Some governments and advocacy groups have labeled the group a cult, and well, I can see why. In fourth place, we have the Children of God. Initially called Teens for Christ, Children of God, or COG, was founded in 1968 by rogue preacher David Berg in Huntington Beach, California. Attracting young runaways and hippies, David preached a kind of worship that combined the ways of Jesus Christ with the free love movement of the 1960s. Group living, um, zealous converting, and isolated communes were all pillars of the Children of God Church. Members who got to be around 15,000 people across the world at its peak didn't work or go to school. This COG didn't believe in the um, nuclear family, so younglings were grouped together and lived separately from their parents. In the late 1970s, COG became notorious for the sexual practices that one of the founders' own daughters later described as um, religious sexual coercion. David coined the term flirty fishing, which was a sexual practice in which women would allegedly have sex with men to bring them into the cult. If that wasn't scummy enough, he also promoted and encouraged the sexualization of younglings within the COG community. As David manipulated the COG family with his sadistic practices, members started leaving the community, including the families of actors Joaquin Phoenix and Rose McGowan, who both grew up in the communes. Former COG members began coming forward in the early 1990s, describing an environment that permitted and encouraged the physical and sexual taking advantage of, of younglings. Ricky DePoy appeared on a talk show in 1993 and revealed that he'd been ordered by the group to forcibly fornicate with someone barely in the double digits of age. Ricky later took his own life, sadly like many other members of the group, including the founder's son, Ricky Rodriguez, who was sexually actually taken advantage of throughout his life by his father and the group. Although David died in 1994 while under FBI investigation, the cult continues to exist and now goes by the name Family International, although the group claims that the horrific practices are a thing of the past. Sure. Okay. I trust that as much as I trust the construction in Toronto to meet a deadline. No. In third place, we have the People's Temple. In the 1950s, Indiana resident Jim Jones founded a church that he claimed promoted socialism and equality with the religious elements of Christianity. So initially, he was a little more than, you know, just like a charismatic hustler who faked faith healings by having audience plants pull chicken livers out of congregants' mouths. But as the years progressed, he demanded more and more of his followers. In the early 1970s, Jones moved his group to California and set them up in a commune-like settlement in the Redwood Valley. After he established several locations throughout the state, including its headquarters, 
Towers in San Francisco, the temple forged ties with many left-wing political figures and claimed to have 20,000 members, even though apparently 3 to 5,000 is a little more likely. Jones eventually came to believe that the nuclear war was imminent and moved his followers again to the South American country of Guyana, which he thought would be, you know, outside the potential danger zone. The group lived there for several years as the People's Temple Agricultural Project, but after former members started speaking out against the church, San Francisco Congressman Leo Ryan decided to travel to Jonestown to investigate claims of uh, not so good things. During his visit, a number of temple members expressed a desire to leave with him and accompanied Leo to the local airstrip at Port Kitsuma. There they were intercepted by self-styled temple security guards who opened fire on the group, killing uh, the congressman, three journalists, one of the defectors, as well as injuring nine others, including Ryan's aide, Jackie Spear. A few seconds of the incident were captured on video by NBC cameraman Bob Brown, one of the journalists who had their lives ended in the attack. That evening, in Jonestown, Jones ordered his congregation to drink a concoction of cyanide laced grape flavored flavor aid. Oh, uh, right. This is where the phrase drinking the Kool Aid originates. All in all, 918 people died. This includes four that died at the temple headquarters that night in the Guyanese capital of Georgetown. Some members resisted ending their lives and were injected with fatal doses of cyanide, as were those too young to drink the drink, and some others survived by fleeing through the jungle. Until 9 it was the largest loss of American civilian life in history, which sends a chill down my spine to just like think about. Just a teensy little side note by the way, surviving temple members of the mass death in the US announced their fears of being targeted by a hit squad composed of Jonestown survivors. Similarly, in 1979, the Associated Press reported a US congressional aide's claim that there were 120 white brainwashed assassins out from Jonestown awaiting the trigger word to pick up their hit. Temple insider Michael Prokes, who had been ordered to deliver a suitcase which contained temple funds, which were supposed to be transferred to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, killed himself in March of 1979, four months after the Jonestown incident. In the days leading up to his death, Michael sent notes to several people, together with a 30-page statement he had written about the temple. He had arranged for a press conference in a Modesto, California motel room, during which he read a statement to the eight reporters who attended, before, you know, excusing himself, entering a restroom, and uh, ending his life. The levels of brainwashing displayed here are just too deep to unpack. In second place, we have the family. Oh sure, because that totally sounds wholesome. Known as one of Australia's most notorious cults, yep, you know, not an American one for once, the family began with Anne Hamilton Byrne, who was a yoga teacher who believed herself to be a reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Oh, right, and unlike all the other listings today, this one was founded, yep, by a woman. She teamed up with parapsychologist Raynor Johnson in the mid-1960s to form what was initially known as the Great White Brotherhood. Uh, Christ, I swear I'm not talking about the um, Triple K group or the, the Yahtzees, I promise. Over the course of several years, Anne adopted 28 offspring by receiving the young as gifts from members, as well as by falsifying papers to convince others to give their spawn up for adoption, all in the hope of creating a master race that would survive the apocalypse she believed to be imminent. While other adults in the group were known as either aunties or uncles, Anne claimed to be the biological mother of all 28 adoptees. She also told the offspring she was, yep, Jesus Christ, and when they didn't live up to her exact standards, they were punished forcibly, starved, or, you know, dosed with LSD. Because, you know, a crazy brain trip is exactly how to make little ones behave. The cult went undetected for years because the adoptees were forced to hide whenever visitors arrived. But in 1987, the group's headquarters was finally raided and all the younglings were removed from the premises. Anne was only ever charged with falsifying birth certificates, and in 2019 she died from dementia at about 98 years old, having never faced consequences for her actions. Part of me, my brain feels like it's about to explode. They had 32 years to nail her, and all she got was falsifying birth certificates? I feel like giving underage folks LSD should have been, you know, the priority of offense charging. In first place, we have Om Shinrikyo. Founded by Shoko Asahara in 1984, Om Shinrikyo is a Japanese new religious movement and doomsday cult who first made headlines in the late 80s amid accusations that Asahara was forcing members to donate money to the group and holding them against their will. Oh, pardon me, I'll uh, backtrack for a moment. Although Om was, you know, from the beginning considered controversial in Japan, it was not initially associated with serious crimes. Om's public relations activities included publishing comics and animated cartoons that attempted to tie its religious ideas to popular anime and manga themes, including space missions, powerful weapons, world conspiracies, and the quest for ultimate truth. Like many cult leaders, Asahara believed in an imminent doomsday, this time caused by a world war started by the United States. And of course, according to him, only his followers would survive. I feel like a broken record, but don't worry. This wouldn't be in first place if it wasn't worse than, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid, giving underagers LSD, and branding. Okay, well worse in my opinion. I'll admit, my brain's a little warped these days for a morale 
mortality scale. In 1991, OM began using wiretapping to get NTT uniforms and equipment and created a manual for wiretapping. In July of 1993, cult members sprayed large amounts of liquid containing bacillus and thrasis spores from a cooling tower on the roof of OM Shinrikyo's Tokyo headquarters. However, their plan to cause an anthrax epidemic failed. The attack resulted in a large number of complaints about you know bad odors, but no infections. At the end of 1993, the cult started secretly manufacturing the nerve agent Sarin, and later VX. So Om tested its Sarin on sheep at Banja Warren Station, a remote pastoral property in Western Australia, killing 29 sheep. Both Sarin and VX were then used in several assassinations and attempts over 1994 to 1995. In 1995, the group executed a sarin gas attack in the Tokyo subway, which caused the deaths of 12 people and injured 50 more. The group says that those who carried out the attacks did so secretly, without being known to other executives and ordinary believers. After that attack, Japanese authorities learned that the group had also been responsible for the death of lawyer Tsutsumi Sakamoto, who was working on a class action lawsuit against Aum Shinrikyo at the time of his death. Oh, uh, almost forgot. The group also killed his wife and uh, descendant. On the 6th of July 2018, after exhausting all appeals, Asahara and six followers on death row were executed as punishment for the 1995 attacks and other crimes. So I'm glad that unlike the last leader I discussed, some justice was actually served in this situation. Six additional followers were executed on the 26th of the same month. At 12.10am on New Year's Day of 2019, at least nine people were injured when a car was deliberately driven into crowds celebrating the New Year on Takashita Street in Tokyo. Local police reported the arrest of Kazuhiro Kusakabe, the suspected driver, who allegedly admitted to intentionally ramming his vehicle into crowds to protest his opposition to the death penalty, specifically in retaliation for, uh, yeah, the execution of the aforementioned um, cult members. Number five, the Manson family. Starting out with the most famous of the cults on this list, we have the group of young people who fell under the spell of Charles Manson in the late 1960s in California, USA. Charles Manson was in and out of prison for most of his life before settling in San Francisco and beginning to establish himself as a guru during the height of the Summer of Love hippie culture. Using some elements from the philosophy of the Process Church of Final Judgment, who believed that at the end of the world Jesus and Satan would join forces to judge humanity, Manson formed a group of mostly young women, teaching them that they were reincarnations of the original Christians, and that he was Jesus Christ. In a converted school bus, the group made their way to Los Angeles, where Manson preached and continued to grow his group of followers. They stayed in the home of Dennis Wilson, of the Beach Boys for a time before eventually moving them to an old disused western movie set, Spawn Ranch. In exchange for the company of the many female followers, the owner of the ranch, George Spawn, allowed Manson and his growing family to stay at the ranch free of charge. Manson began using his followers for extortion, taking a music teacher who they believed had inherited a large fortune hostage in his home and demanding that he join the cult and turn over the money. The man maintained that they were mistaken, and Manson attacked him with a sword before having one of his followers finish the job. In the cult's most famous incident, Manson sent four family members to the home of Hollywood actress Sharon Tate with instructions for them to end the lives of Tate and her four guests who were staying with her. The next night, these family members were joined by three others and brought by Manson to the home of Leno and Rosemary LaBianca, where they broke in and tied up the two residents at Manson's instructions. He then ordered them to dispatch the victims and left. Although it hasn't been conclusively proven, the Manson family are believed to be responsible for at least 15 other people, with Manson himself claiming at one point that he was responsible for 35 total deaths. Manson was apprehended and put on trial along with the family members who had carried out his orders, but the trial showed just what a hold Manson still had over his family. Family members showed up outside the courthouse where they held a vigil while armed with hunting knives. They threatened witnesses, setting fire to one man's van while he was still inside it. The trial itself was also a wild time, with one of the defense attorneys who Manson disagreed with going missing and being discovered murdered, and Manson at one point leaping over a table to try and attack the judge while the other defendants began chanting in Latin. Manson and the murderous family members were sent to prison in 1971. Manson remained in prison until his death in 2017. Number 4. Om Shinrikyo this Japanese doomsday cult started out as a simple yoga and meditation class, which was founded by Shoko Asahara, using his bizarre interpretations of various forms of Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, yoga, and the works of Nostradamus. In 1992, Shoko published a book that claimed that he was not only Christ, but Japan's only enlightened master. He claimed that he had the ability to take away the sins and bad deeds of his followers and transfer spiritual power to them. As is the case in a lot of cults, he claimed that doomsday was 
was fast approaching, and that everyone except his followers would be the movement grew, eventually getting enough members to be considered an official religion. Membership continued to grow, but rumblings began emerging that some members were being tricked into joining, were being forced to donate large sums of money, being held against their will, and in one case even murdered when they tried to leave. An anti-cult lawyer tried to sue the group and soon went missing with his wife and child. Things escalated even further in 1993, when the group tried to use a machine to pump anthrax onto a neighborhood in Tokyo. Although thankfully, the group had stolen the wrong type of anthrax and no one was hurt. Due to the failure of the anthrax, the group began manufacturing sarin and VX nerve gas, which they used in their subsequent attacks. In 1994, the group used a converted refrigerator truck to release the gas on a neighborhood where judges, who were presiding over a lawsuit against the group, lived. 500 people were injured and 8 died, but the attack was not linked to the cult at the time. A few months later, the brother of a member who had escaped was kidnapped, dispatched by the group, and disposed of with a microwave-powered incinerator. He had left a note saying that should he go missing, the group was responsible. Azahara was trying to manufacture weapons, and in order to distract the police, had some of his followers carry out a devastating attack. On March 20th, 1995, Ohm members boarded five separate trains in Tokyo subway system and released sarin gas, resulting in 13 people dying, 54 being seriously injured, and between 900 and 80 and 6,000 people being hurt. This distraction backfired and the police raided the group's base at the foot of Mount Fuji and discovered explosives, weapons, biological warfare agents, and even a Russian military helicopter. Over 150 cult members were arrested. The next month, a burning paper bag containing a hydrogen cyanide device was found and diffused. Had it not been found in time, over 10,000 people could have died. Several other similar devices were found in the days following, and more disasters were averted. Azahara was eventually arrested as his cult continued to attack people connected with the investigation, sending bombs in the mail to the governor, resulting in his secretary's fingers being blown off. In October of 1995, the group was stripped of its religious status and went bankrupt, but it managed to rebrand and still operates in a limited capacity to this day. Azahara and the 12 other cult members who had been found responsible for the attacks were arrested and held until their executions in 2018. Number 1. The Thuggy Cult The Thuggy were a secret society operating in India in the mid-1800s who were known for attacking travelers and garroting them with a weapon called a rumal. Its members were trained from childhood in its use. They considered efficient and quiet acts of murder to be the greatest accomplishment possible. They would follow groups of travelers until they made camp, at which point they would attack. Word of the thuggy began to grow as numerous bodies began to be discovered in wells around the countryside. However, the thuggy were not attacking their victims simply to take their valuables. The number one rule of the cult was not to shed any of their victims' blood, as they were actually human sacrifices for their god, Kali. The thuggy believed that constant indulgence in vices was the only way to become closer to and achieve union with their god. During the time that the cult was active, over 30,000 people were attacked by the thuggy and sacrificed to Kali. British officers were tasked with eliminating the cult and began mapping out the cult's attacks in order to predict where the attacks would likely take place and set traps for the thuggy while disguised as merchants and travelers. Between 1830 and 1841, at least 3,700 cult members were captured, effectively ending the group. Many were put in prison for the rest of their lives, with 500 of them being hanged. Without exception, all of them that went to the gallows showed no emotion or remorse, often requesting to put on their own nooses themselves. When asked if he was sorry, one member who claimed to have the thuggy record for most victims at 931 responded that no one should ever feel bad for following their trade. The term thug is still used to this day to describe a brutal criminal, and the group is remembered for their various appearances as villains in films over the years, such as when they were depicted by Steven Spielberg in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Number 3. The Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint, known as FLDS for short. Time to focus on the fundamentalist sects that uh, split off when the core religion opted to renounce the practice of polygamy. Technically speaking, polygamy is the practice or custom of having more than one wife or husband at the same time. And while I'm not judging multiple partners or open relationships when they're consensual or of age, there's a lot of egg to unpack here. It is estimated that 6,000 to 10,000 members reside within the congregate sister sites of Hilldale, Utah, Colorado City, Arizona, El Dorado, Texas, Westcliff, Colorado, Mancos, Colorado, Creston and Bountiful, British Columbia, and Pringle, South Dakota. Those who wish to continue the practice remained Mormon, but on their own terms. Polygamy remains, you know, illegal, and in 1953, an entire FLDS community was arrested in Short Creek, Arizona, otherwise known as modern-day Colorado City, and most had their little ones taken from them for safety. 
A compound in Texas was raided in 2008 after Child Protective Services was made aware of allegations of poor living situations. Over 400 younglings were taken from the compound and placed in CPS custody. So I remember hearing about the raid while watching the Oprah Winfrey show with my mom of all things. If my brain serves me right, it was about 10 months after the raid when all of the younglings were returned to the Yearning for Zion ranch and it was such huge news that she was being granted access to this top secret compound. Leader of the FLDS Warren Jeffs remains in his position, you know, despite being in prison for life after acts against minors. Number 1. Good News International Church The Good News International Ministries, GNIM for short, or Good News International Church, was founded by Paul McKenzie and his first wife in 2003. So this group attracted international attention in April of this year when it was revealed that McKenzie had allegedly instructed members to starve themselves to meet Jesus before the end of the world, which has resulted in the deaths of over 400 people. And when you consider more than 600 people have been reported missing, it's just a yikes situation. About 65 rescued followers were charged with attempted self-ending of life after they refused to eat during their stay at a rescue center. The doomsday cult is adamantly anti-Western, and with amenities such as healthcare, education, and sports being dismissed as evils of Western life, and with Mackenzie condemning the United States, the United Nations, and the Catholic Church as tools of Satan. Look, I'm all for condemning the Catholic Church, but calling it a tool of Satan feels like an oxymoron. The group devotes much of its teachings to the end times, ergo I've been dubbed a doomsday cult. The definition of which is a cult that believes in apocalyptism and millennia terrorism including both these, you know, that predict disasters and those that attempt to destroy the entire universe. Mackenzie founded the GNIM in 2003 and accumulated a sizable following, largely due to convincing his followers that he could speak directly with God. Beginning in the late 2010s, Mackenzie's church began to receive a renewed wave of scrutiny regarding the internal practices of the organization, particularly in 2017 when Mackenzie and his wife faced several charges relating to the church. He was chastised for inciting students to abandon their education after denouncing it as ungodly, as well as radicalizing and denying medical care to them afterwards. Several students died as a result, and in 2017, 93 students were rescued by government authorities from the group. After another arrest in 2019, he departed Malindi and headed to the Shakahola Forest, where the mass starvation occurred earlier this year. Now, Mackenzie did not join his followers in the mass starvation. In fact, a dietary menu was found on the wall in one of the special houses in the forest, believed to be his resting room. He's currently under police custody as the process of exhuming the bodies continues. Police authorities claim that some bodies were missing organs and believed they were being harvested and sold. Number five, the cult of Dionysus. The cult of Dionysus has sparked dark speculations and controversies over many years. It's a highly secretive organization and knowing what exactly occurs within the privacy of members is unknown. Just to list a few of the many theories, here are some of the dark speculations and controversies surrounding the cult of Dionysus. Quote, Excess and madness. The cult celebration of intoxication and ecstasy led to accusations of excess and madness. Critics argue that the excessive consumption of wine and the frenzied behavior of cult participants could lead to a breakdown of societal order and morality, moral and social disruption. Many in the ancient world viewed the Bacchanalian and Dionysian festivals as a threat to established social norms. The rejection of traditional rules and the temporary suspension of societal rules during these festivals raised concerns about moral and social disruption. Bodily liberation. Some Dionysian and rituals were associated with liberation and promiscuity. Some believed that these practices would lead to licentious behavior and the erosion of traditional family structures. Foreign influence. The cult of Dionysus was often associated with foreign influence and was viewed with suspicion by those who feared the introduction of foreign beliefs and practices into their culture. Accusations of political subversion. In some instances, the cult was seen as a potential threat to political stability. Rulers and authorities worried that the Dionysian festivals could be used as a cover for political subversion or rebellion. Mystery and secrecy. The secret and exclusive nature of some Dionysian rites gave rise to speculations and conspiracy theories. The mystery of religion aspect of the cult fueled rumors and concerns about what might be happening behind closed doors. Tragedies and harm. The association of Dionysus with tragedy in Greek drama led to the belief that participation in Dionysian rituals could result in real life tragedies and harm. 
end quote. Though the speculations likely do hold some truth, being able to definitively answer whether any or all of these theories are true is impossible. Records of the cult's activity were often exaggerated through misunderstandings or misinterpretations of the cult's practices. But it is thought that many of the rituals have been spotted throughout history, hinting that the cult may not be as inactive as many think. Number 4. The Blackburn Cult May Otis Blackburn's cult, which is referred to with many names, including the Order of the Doves and, of course, the Blackburn cult, was a controversial religious movement that emerged in Los Angeles, California. The cult's beliefs and practices were described as a combination of mysticism, apocalyptic prophecies, and unorthodox spiritual teachings. The cult was unofficially founded in the early 1920s, centering its teachings on the notion that May Otis Blackburn, their leader and founder, was a chosen prophet, selected by divine forces to guide followers through the impending end of the world. May claimed to receive direct revelations and instructions from angels and other spiritual entities. She warned her followers to prepare for the looming apocalypse, leading them into believing that only they would be saved from the cataclysmic events she spoke of. The beliefs also included select sections of witchcraft and mysticism, which actually led to legal troubles for May Otis Blackburn and her followers. In 1929, she, along with her son Raymond, faced a high-profile trial in which they were accused of practicing witchcraft and defrauding their followers. The trial received significant media attention and portrayed the cult as a group of radicals who manipulated their members for personal gain. May Otis Blackburn was a writer also. She produced numerous books and pamphlets to spread her religious doctrines and apocalyptic visions. These writings played a crucial role in spreading her teachings and attracting new converts to the Order of the Doves. Despite the cult's strange practices and legal challenges, it managed to gather a following during its existence. However, the relentless scrutiny from the law surrounding a certain body found under a house frequented by the cult and disturbed opinions from the public ultimately led to its disbandment. May Otis Blackburn's life took a quieter turn after the cult's disillusion, and she passed away in 1951. But to this day, it's not known certainly whether there are still practicing members, whether it be people who grew up in the cult or those whose parents raised them under the set of beliefs. Number 3. Order of Nine Angels The Order of Nine Angels, or the ONA, is one of the most mysterious and highly controversial groups in the world of modern Satanism and the occult. The ONA was founded in the UK in the 1960s, promoting extreme and often dangerous forms of Satanism. Its core beliefs and practices are complex and unconventional, which has led to bouts of intense debate and controversy, from Satanists and non-practicing communities alike. The heart of their philosophy is the concept of the sinister tradition, which is a radical, committed path that encourages members to challenge societal norms and embrace chaos and darkness. They view Satan as a symbol of rebellion against the established order, advocating for personal transformation through dark and sometimes harmful experiences. One of the most notorious aspects of the ONA is its advocacy for culling, a term they use to describe acts of harm and even homo sapien sacrifice. Some of the ONS's writings are extremely extremely dark and grossly disturbing, further demonstrating their deeply antisocial and extremist perspective. While they remain a highly secretive, tight-knit, and controversial group, their writings and philosophy have managed to spread widely and even found their way into other areas of the occult, impacting various forms of alternative spirituality. The Order of the Nine Angels remains a fringe and extremist organization to this day. Their beliefs and practices are widely criticized and condemned for their proud and loud promotion of harm and extremism. Extremism. As with any belief system, it's important to approach their beliefs with caution and to be aware of the potential harm and danger it can pose, especially if it's taken to the extreme. Number two, Sashiko Ito. The bizarre and disturbing saga of Sashiko Ito, the woman who would come to be known as the drumstick killer, began in 1990. It all started when her husband suffered a back injury, which not only incapacitated him, but also led him down a very dark path of drinking and gambling, which ended up pushing the couple into very deep debt, which eventually forced them to sell their home and move to a different town. In their new town, they became involved with a religious group, which was deeply involved in spiritual faith healing. But their 
involvement didn't last long because they used the organization's name without permission and were expelled. This led to Edo's husband experiencing a mental breakdown and disappearing without a trace in 1992. With her husband gone, the descent into her heinous actions began. She moved approximately 100 miles north of Tokyo and started performing spiritual healings. Edo proclaimed that she was a healer and a psychic, gradually making increasingly grandiose claims. She eventually declared herself a god who possessed the power to drive demons out of people. These statements quickly attracted a large following of devotees who flocked to her for services. Edo's cult grew quickly, with over a dozen believers and their family members living in her home and participating in rituals. Her rituals, involving drumstick beatings meant to end the dirty body and purify the soul, quickly escalated in aggression. She accused some of her followers of being possessed by a bad fox and had them beaten until they were hardly alive. In June of 1995, less than three years after Edo moved, one of Edo's followers was hospitalized with severe injuries from a ritual. This follower also reported that her husband had abruptly disappeared after visiting Edo's house. This raised suspicions and led the police to search the premises, where they uncovered a truly horrific scene. Six decomposing bodies, two men and four women were discovered, some mummified and wrapped in futons. All of their lives were ended due to the harm inflicted during Edo's rituals. Edo, her daughter, and a man named Yutaka Nomoto, and another follower were arrested and charged with the deaths. Edo's survivor, who had reported the cult, was also arrested. Edo initially claimed that the deaths were unintentional and were simply a part of a religious exorcism. The trial resulted in Edo receiving a life-ending sentence, while her accomplices received prison sentences ranging from 18 years to life. On September 27, 2012, at the age of 65, Edo was hanged after several unsuccessful appeals, hopefully ending the belief system that she created, but no one's quite sure. Number one, Temple of the Black Light. The Temple of the Black Light, which can also be referred to as the Misanthropic Luciferian Order, MLO, which is what I will be calling it because it's the shortest name. The MLO is a group associated with left-hand path spirituality and philosophy. MLO was founded in Sweden in the early 1990s, and it has gained popularity in cult theorists for its unique approach to Satanism and the left-hand path. The central notion of the MLO is the self-created worship that they call Chaos Gnostic Satanism, which sets them apart from many other satanic groups. MLO's beliefs are rooted in a drastic form of nihilism and a deep desire to embrace chaos, darkness, and spiritual rebellion. Honestly, real. They believe in an intangible force called chaos, which they see as a destructive, creative, and transformative entity that has great power and aims to oppose the order and constraints of the universe. MLO's members revere Lucifer as a symbol of enlightenment, liberation, and defiance against traditional religious and societal norms. However, their interpretation of Lucifer is much different from popular depictions of him. To them, Lucifer represents a dark and chaotic force that opposes established religion and and the moral codes of society. The MLO is known for its extreme and often controversial writings, which explore the esoteric beliefs of the religion in depth. Their texts often feature highly complex and cryptic symbolism, which is intended to be understood by those who are deeply committed to the group's philosophy and not for those outside. I mean, that's a good way to reject skeptics. Like if skeptics were like, dude, this text doesn't make any sense, the members could just say, yeah, well, duh, you wouldn't get it. You can't sit with us. The Temple of the Black Light is considered a highly controversial group within the broader satanic community as well. They are criticized for their extremist and nihilistic views, as their beliefs are not an accurate representation of traditional satanic traditions and beliefs, which normally encompass a wide spectrum of beliefs and practices. The Temple of the Black Light actually remains a small and secretive group that's still active to this day. Number five, Kali Meteor. Thousands of years ago, a meteor hit Estonia with the force of a Hiroshima bomb. The meteor fragmented, creating nine craters, which are now called the Kali Crater Field. One of these craters was over 100 meters and became a site of holy worship for some of the locals. Surrounding the water-filled crater is a large stone wall from the Late Bronze Age, and the wall is stronger than any of the other similar structures in the surrounding area that were made at the time, hinting to scientists and historians the importance of the building. A large, concentrated amount of animal remains were found at the Kali Crater and led anthropologists to believe that they were used as ritualistic sacrifices. The thing is, the bones were found thousands of years after the wall was built, meaning the crater was a consistent site of worship for 
thousands of years. There are several legends surrounding the lake, especially in Finnish mythology. Here's a quick synopsis. Quote, Louis, the evil wizard, steals the sun and fire from people, causing total darkness. Ukko, the god of the sky, orders a new sun to be made from a spark. The virgin of the air starts to make a new sun, but the spark drops from the sky and hits the ground. The spark goes to an Aluen, or Kelevan lake, and causes its water to rise. Finnish heroes see the ball of fire falling somewhere behind the Neva River. The heroes head in that direction to seek fire, and they finally gather flames from a forest fire." End quote. The legend mentions a spark of sun, referring to the meteor, which when landed causes a huge impact and a forest fire. I mean, it's like dropping an actual bomb. The impact was insane. The crater has no noted reports of being an active worship site as of today, but such a widespread belief must have been passed down. I highly doubt the beliefs would have just ended there. Number four, the Pythagoreans. Pythagoreanism originated in 600 BC, based on the beliefs and teachings that Pythagoras and his followers held. Pythagoras established the first Pythagorean community in the ancient Greek colony of Croton. The beliefs spread quickly throughout the land, and the death of Pythagoras created even more popularity as people created their own traditions within the belief system. The beliefs influenced Plato, and through him, they influenced Western philosophy. Most of the surviving information on Pythagoras came from Aristotle and the philosophers of the Peripatetic school. The beliefs spread widely, and some say that they have survived as part of the Bashic cults and Orphism. The beliefs included science and religion. Pythagoras was very well known in ancient times for his mathematical achievement, the Pythagorean theorem. I wish he wasn't as well known, because I hated that class. He was also noted for his discovery that music had mathematic foundations. He's been credited as the philosopher who first discovered music intervals and is said to have invented the monochord. As I said, a lot of the information we now have on Pythagoras came from Aristotle and the Peripatetic school. The 5th century BCE information do not have any elements of supernatural entities, but by 4th century BCE, legends and fables were introduced into the belief system. Pythagoras found the first community in Croton during 5th century BCE. He described it as a secret society and he also gained political influence. The military and economy in Croton soon became very strong. In the early years, the Pythagorean sects were closed societies, where new members were chosen by existing ones, based on intelligence and discipline. Then they went under a five-year initiation period where they would listen to teachings in complete silence. Then they would complete a test and if they passed, they would be welcomed to the inner circle but they were able to leave whenever they wanted. Soon, it became customary for family members to become Pythagoreans, as it developed into a philosophical tradition that influenced everyday life and swore members to secrecy. Within his teachings, Pythagoras emphasized moderation, vegetarianism, respect for elders, and the state, and believed in a monogamous family structure. Boring. They believed the soul of humans was buried in the body, and the highest reward a human could attain was the soul joining the gods, meaning that they escaped reincarnation. They believed the soul was buried in the body as punishment, but that the soul could be purified. So they did a lot of soul cleansing rituals. The list of beliefs honestly go on and on. They include things like harmony, music, geometry, arithmetic, numbers, and cosmology. The disputes regarding Pythagoras' teachings began shortly after his death, which was caused by an arson attack. The disagreements led to two separate Pythagorean traditions, Akousmatikoi and Mathematikoi. The Mathematikoi recognized the religious undertones of Pythagoras and studied it as part of their practice, but they focused more on the science and research part of Pythagoreanism. Their scientific pursuits were largely mathematical, but they did also conduct research in fields that Pythagoras had in his lifetime. The Akousmatikoi believed humans had to act in inappropriate ways. They refused to recognize the advancements that the Mathematikoi were making in mathematical and scientific research, which were, as I said, in line with Pythagoras' beliefs. They also challenged his original teachings, including harmony, justice, ritual purity, and morals. The tension between the two groups only grew as their individual beliefs grew further and further apart over the years. Number three, the snake cult of Glycon. Glycon was an ancient snake god who had a large and influential cult in the Roman Empire during the second century. The cult is thought to have originated in Macedonia, where other snake cults much like Glycon had existed for centuries. Macedonians believed snakes had magical powers in fertility. Initially, the cult did not worship the spirit of the snake or an abstract idea of a godly snake. Instead, they worshipped an actual, physically tangible snake. 
that resembled the god. The creator of this cult, Alexander, foretold that there would be a reincarnation of Asclepius. It's said that Alexander procured an egg, and when the people gathered to see it hatch, Alexander cut the goose egg open and revealed the prophetic snake god inside. The small snake grew to the size of a man, with the features of a human on its face, including long blonde hair. Some say that the figure depicted at this stage was actually just a puppet, or a trained snake with a puppet head. Creepy. <laughs> the focus of worship in the cult was fertility. Barren women would bring offerings to Glycon in the hopes of becoming pregnant. By 160 AD, the cult's teachings and methods began to spread. An inscription from that era reads, Glycon protect us from the plague cold. The same year, the government of Asia declared that he was the protector of Glycon's oracle. The governor also married Alexander's daughter. Many sought prophecies from Alexander, yearning to learn of what their future holds and even how they might perish. The cult's beliefs were spread through lower social classes and over time even high class citizens and officials were die hard believers of Glycon's healing and of the prophecies Alexander told. The support and belief of the emperors paired with the healing powers of the serpents throughout history lured many people into the cult. There was no shortage of converts and believers. Roman coins were even made in honor of Glycon, which likely happened way after Alexander's lifetime. For at least a hundred years after Alexander's passing, a new Glycon cult formed and began to spread their influence. Statues and other archaeological finds have been located in Tomi, now known as Constata, displaying just how present the cult was throughout history in the large city. The Glycon cult is still referred to, to this day. The statue that was found in Constata, Romania is on display at the Constata History and Archaeology Museum. The statue is even commemorated on a postage stamp from 1974 and on a 10,000-lay banknote from 1994. And to this day, people declare themselves as devotees of Glycon. Talk about a long lasting influence. Number two, the Elysian Mysteries. The Elysian Mysteries were initiations that were held every year for the cult of Demeter and Persephone. They took place at the Panhellenic Sanctuary of Ulysses in ancient Greece. They're considered the most famous of the secret ancient Greek religious sites. Their basis was an old agrarian cult, and there's evidence that they were derived from the religious practices of the Mycenaean period. The mysteries refer to Hades' abduction of Demeter's daughter, Persephone, and was told in three phases. Descent, Search, and Ascent. Originally, the cult of Demeter was private, hidden under the Telesterion. Some of the practices are seemingly influenced by other religious practices, specifically those from the Mycenaean period. The group would hold a feast. At the beginning, priests would fill two special vessels and then pour them out, one to the east and one to the west. Then, the people would look upwards and downwards while chanting, reign and conceive. Then, a child was initiated into the group from the divine fire. Honestly, I tried to decode this part for a while, but I had very little success, I'm sorry. The climax of the celebration represented the force of the new life. When the mysteries started, immortality was not a part of the beliefs, but as time went on, they believed that it would grant them a better fate in the underworld. Eventually, the mysteries were spread wide, and people from all over flocked to participate. Eventually, the mysteries were controlled by two families, which led to a huge number of initiates. The only requirements were that you had never directly caused someone's death and that you were able to speak Greek. Men, women, and slaves were all welcome. The mysteries came to an end around 170 AD, after it was ransacked by the Samaritans. Eventually, the building decayed and the religion died down, but it is still referred to often in art and literature, and many interesting theories regarding present-day mysteries have been mentioned. Number one, the cult of sacrifice. The cult of sacrifice is a pretty interesting one, and it actually differs a lot from the others because the cult did not worship any specific entity or object of power. The cult of sacrifice originated thousands of years ago, but its presence was not constant. It mainly occurred during great times of stress when its belief and practices would be most useful. Records of the cult are poorly recalled and only exist in written form, so the origin's location is unknown, but it is speculated that it began in the eastern hemisphere of Rathnir because most written evidence was found there. As I mentioned earlier, the cult did not have an object or entity that they worshipped. Instead, they believed in sacrificing elements of their own life for the good of others. The cult was based on the idea of charity and self-sacrifice for the benefit of others, in particular, those who need it most. The cult took these ideals to an absolute extreme, though. They would starve and fast, not because it was a religious practice, but because they'd given all of their food to others who were perceived as having less. They were minimalists, not because they wanted to be, but because they would give all of their money
money and material possessions away to those who were perceived as having less. Essentially, they would damage themselves to the point of illness and death just in the name of sacrifice and in the hope of helping. This was most likely the reason that the cult had such sporadic activity throughout centuries, because you know, they were pretty extreme and a lot of people didn't survive. To join the cult, the only thing necessary was the blessing of an existing cult member, like any cult member. So yeah, it was able to spread through small communities pretty quickly. I'm kind of stuck on how strange the towns that this cult was prominent in probably looked. Like, I'm imagining people sleeping on the streets, freezing, overheating, and starving while there's just like a massive hoard of food that they've placed in the town center for the less fortunate. But like no one will touch the food and all of their houses are empty because they're the only ones living there. Crazy. <laughs> the cult is essentially extinct because you know, mostly everyone who is a member ended up dying from their loyal devotion. However, the cult came to its official end on August 8, 2021 when the last member died. The cult officially died because if you remember, the only way to join the cult is to be blessed by an existing member. So the faith is officially extinguished. I mean, their ideology is good, but extremism is never good. Middle ground, that's the sweet spot. Number five, the brethren. Do you feel like the modern world has got you down? Got you running around, feeling overwhelmed? Perhaps you need a break from it all and you wanna get away. I want to go back to a simpler time. Well then perhaps the Brethren is the movement you've been looking for. Founded by Jim T. Roberts, the movement seeks to shed all of the convenience and accommodations of modern living, with its members instead choosing to live as vagrants, drifting on the edge of society, away from the prying eye of the modern world. Their leader believes that in order to be guaranteed a spot in heaven, one must purify themselves. And to the brethren, this means purifying themselves of just about every facet of modern living. As part of their renouncement of all modern living, brethren must forsake all of their family, friends, their jobs, their livelihoods, all in favor of their new brothers. You aren't allowed to partake in any material goods of any kind. Sew your own clothing and eat what you can scavenge. This particularly grisly habit is what gave the cult its enduring nickname of garbage eaters for their tendency to dumpster dive. You're not even allowed to laugh, celebrate, or play, as all celebrations must be saved for the return of the Savior at the end of the world. Although giving those conditions, I'm not sure what you'd have to laugh about. It goes as far, too, as members being barred from receiving treatment or medicine, even for common curable illnesses. Because members are forced to cut themselves off from their families, oftentimes members disappear without their family members ever even getting to know what happened. As such, groups have sprung up to try and reconnect brethren to their families and hopefully get them a dinner that didn't come out of a dumpster. Why not toss a subscribe our way and join our group here? Our teachings are scary videos every day, and the only thing you have to give us is a subscribe, and if you're feeling really generous, maybe a like too. Let's keep going. Number four, happy science. Happy science, formerly known as the Institute for Research in Human Happiness, is a Japanese New Age religion that's sort of a loot bag for as many religious concepts as you can think of. In happy science, all gods that have been worshipped throughout history across various religions were actually all the same god, named El Cantare, roughly translating to the singer. The group's founder, Ryoho Okawa, just happens to be the incarnation of all these holy deities manifested as one man. He also claims to have the energies of various celebrities inside him, including Freddie Mercury and former US presidents. The group preaches happiness, obviously. Following the group's mantra, in order to obtain happiness, one must practice the principles of happiness known as the fourfold path. Love that gives, wisdom, self-reflection, and progress. Now, happy science isn't just some fringe group in a tent in the backwoods. Rough estimates suggest that the group pulls inwards of $45 million a year. Sounds like there's some kind of profit happening here. That's a, that, that's a little pun for you. Happy Science has a full-on media division, producing several animated and live-action films and publishing books numbering close to the thousands, mostly being transcriptions of Okawa's lectures about happiness, spirituality, and occasionally aliens, as a major part of the group's belief revolve around UFOs, aliens, and other cosmic entities. The group is fairly widespread, boasting temples across the world and various continents. The group's statistics claim that there are 11 million members worldwide, although more conservative estimates put it around 30,000 worldwide. Regardless, happy science is something that's clearly making a lot of people happy. Number three, realism. Realism is the teaching that humanity was birthed by a hyper-advanced race of aliens called the Elohim, 
who genetically engineered us as their children. Our most famous religious leaders over the years were Elohim human hybrids whose wondrous abilities and powers were mislabeled as prophets. It's said that by 2035, if Raelism's followers have achieved the tenets correctly and fulfilled the movement's teaching by spreading its message and building an embassy to welcome its 39 prophets, the group rose to prominence in the 1970s when its leader, Claude Vorian, who called himself Rayo, claims he had an experience with a UFO where a spacecraft flying overhead was full of beings who told him about humanity's future and past and handed him a bible and told him it was his mission to build that embassy. Now all of this sounds like pretty standard cult stuff, worshipping aliens who are secret progenitors, but where things get pretty interesting and worthy of note is that around 2002, a company called Clonade, with direct ties to realism, claimed to have done the impossible and cloned a baby girl, appropriately named Eve. Immediately it spurned all kind of controversy, led to several investigations, discussions about the ethics and morality of the situation, but despite all this, no actual evidence of the clone baby ever came up. Eve isn't the only alleged baby birthed this way through Clonade, with several claims of Clonade brand clones being produced since the original story in 2002, all with dubious claims, including controversial rapper Kid Boo who claims to have been born there. So either Eve is still hiding somewhere or maybe it was a bit of an exaggeration. Regardless, Clonaid charges up to $200,000 for their services, which might seem a bit expensive, but hey, you're getting a great deal on a clone, you're gonna make your money back on that. So if anyone's got a piggy bank just weighing them down, please send me a message and then get back to me and introduce me to you and your clone. Number two, the Church of Bible Understanding. Hey, real quick for me, what's your favorite Seinfeld episode? Yeah, I probably could have guessed it was the comeback or the contest, and those are both great answers. But what about the checks? Where George gets involved with that group of carpet cleaners who end up trying to recruit for a cult, and, and he's all mad they want his boss, but they don't want him? That's the kind of shenanigan that could only happen to Costanza. Turns out that episode was based on a real group called the Church of Bible Understanding, although at the time they were going by Christian Brothers Carpet Cleaners, no doubt where the idea came from. This undertaking was one of the group's many noble business ventures, including a used van business and a New York chain of used antique stores. Like most cults, the group was led by a charismatic figurehead, one Stuart Trail, who maintained to his followers that only he was capable of understanding the word of God and understanding how to annoy George Costanza. Their leader was expelled from the Pentecostal church he worshipped at in the early 70s, and after his expulsion, refused to give up the dream and formed his own church, promising a communal lifestyle of salvation, and if reports from former members are to be believed, hard work for below minimum wage. Members were isolated from their friends, families, and communities, and encouraged to devote themselves wholly to the church. Besides a less than flattering appearance on Seinfeld, the group most recently made headlines after an orphanage they'd built in Haiti had burned to the ground. After several claims that orphanages the group had been producing in Haiti had been extremely substandard, shoddy, overcrowded, and dirty. The leader, Stuart Trail, passed away in 2018. Current estimates suggest that the group has dwindled down from thousands of members in its heyday to just dozens now. And there's no word if Larry David was ever a member or associated. Number one, the Nuibian Nation. Dwight York had a dream. Like many Americans, he believed in simple things, like amassing an army to help him fight Satan amongst the stars. Let me back that up for you just a little bit and introduce you to the Nuabian Nation, or the United Nuabian Nation of Moors. Adding just a twist of Christianity, African rituals, and a heavy dose of Egyptian mythology mixed with aliens, Dwight York had a perfect recipe for a wild cult story. The nation believed that they needed to prepare themselves for an inevitable duel of the fates among the stars, and that the 144,000 chosen ones would accompany Dwight into outer space for the fate of the galaxy, zooming away on a flying city to Orion to fight Satan. Now I have no comment about any of that. Maybe it was the cult of personality, maybe it was the promise that you could potentially get involved in a star war, but this was a surprisingly popular movement around rural Georgia, where York built up a massive compound that looked a bit like a pavilion out of your favorite Egypt-themed amusement park, and bringing in members in droves. As the numbers grew, the mythology grew, incorporating cloning, racial theory, anti-government conspiracy, and a whole lot more. But the dreams of the Starfarers would be cut short when an investigation in 2002 revealed a horrifying truth. 
that their leader Dwight York was involved in a massive human trafficking operation said to have been comprised of as many of a thousand people. On May 8, 2002, the Sheriff's Department of Georgia with the aid of the FBI shut the entire operation down. York was arrested and sentenced to a life sentence where he's still serving out his 135 years. One Georgia sheriff involved, Sheriff Sills, described the trafficking operation as the best kept secret in Georgia I'd seen in my 47 years as a police officer. The compound was seized and swiftly destroyed. Despite all this though, there are still members out there waiting. Number 5 on this list is Sarah Edmondson. Sarah Edmondson is a Canadian actress who is known for her roles on The Vow, Geronimo Stilton, and At Home in Mitford. She's also known for having been part of a cult. Listverse says, Sarah Edmondson, a young actress, had been searching for a newfound purpose in her life when she boarded a cruise designed to explore spirituality. She did not know that it was a front for the infamous cult NXIVM, nor did she know that it would dictate the next 12 years of her life. During her time in the cult, she climbed the ladder into a position that gave her immense wealth. The power she found herself in was exciting, and it was not until she was inducted into the secret subgroup of the cult that it didn't feel like a positive experience. When she was branded with the letters of the founding members of the cult, she decided that she'd had enough. She became a whistleblower on the cult, drawing worldwide attention to the famous actors and actresses involved in the pyramid scheme and trafficking cult. Sarah Edmondson went on to write a book scarred, but it's a bit troubling. She lured many young women into the cult, but her book seems strangely void of guilt or remorse. Instead, her writing is self-indulgent and gossip-filled. Though she was certainly abused within the cult, she was not blameless for her own wrongdoings. Interesting. If what Listverse says is true, then Sarah might not have been completely from blame for some of the stuff that happened in this cult. I looked into some of what the cult did, and it was not good, guys. This cult was rotten to the core. The founder, Keith Rainier, finally got his though. He was recently sentenced to 120 years in prison. Number 4 on this list is Brielle Decker. Brielle's story is one that is truly moving. Brielle is a true hero. Not only did she escape the fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints cult, she established a refuge at the cult headquarters after the cult leader was arrested. FLDS, a polygamous cult, was led by Warren Jeffs. During his reign, he forced approximately 80 women and children into marriages. Brielle, who was born into the FLDS, knew from a young age that she would be forced to marry the middle-aged man. When she turned 18, he prepared their wedding ceremony and she had no choice but to go along with it. Around this time, the FBI charged Jeffs for forcing an underage girl into marriage and later conducted a raid on the FLDS compound where they discovered just how many children Jeffs had forced into marriage. Jeffs was, of course, charged and sentenced to 20 years in prison. The $100 million FLDS fund, which was seized by the government, was partially given to Brielle to buy Jeffs' mansion and turn it into a refuge for victims. Even though she went through some really horrible stuff, Decker's character remained intact. And now she's taken the experience that happened to her and turned it into a way to help all the others who were affected. Big shout out to Brielle. Number three on this list is Anna LeBaron. A lot of people get poached at a young age to join cults. It's pretty easy to do that poaching if you can start from birth. Anna LeBaron's father, Irville, was the leader of a cult that's been linked to over 20 murders. Her father had 13 wives and over 50 children between them all. Anna, in the book that she's written called The Polygamist's Daughter, details how she and the other children were made to feel isolated and were forced to work 12-hour workdays. Her father was wanted by the FBI for organizing the murders of over 10 people. He was eventually captured, but even after his capture, his followers continued to kill. He had made a master kill list and his devote troops were following it. Luckily, at the age of 13, Anna was able to escape with the help of her sister. She went on to go to college and live a relatively normal life, which is kind of crazy to think about considering how her existence started. Number two on this list is Clary Ashman. Clary, as many followers of cults are, was poached at a young age and just found herself involved in something that she never wanted to be a part of. Listverse says, 
as Claire Ashman grew up in the very traditional Catholic society of St. Pius X. When she left her family and started life outside the strictly Latin faith, she was confused and unsure of herself. In many ways, she was clueless and uneducated by her family. That explains why, when she turned 15, she was not aware that it was creepy for a 27-year-old man to show interest in her. Unfortunately, without healthy relationships for her to learn from, Claire accepted a marriage proposal from the man. Shortly after their marriage, her husband discovered the Order of St. Charbel and Claire found herself smack in the middle of a doomsday cult. Claire was even more confused when she was selected as a princess of the church and was destined to marry the cult leader. For six years, she grappled with the controlling hand of the church and her husband until one day she got her hands on a book called The Beautiful Side of Evil, which first unveiled the term cult to Claire. She understood at once that she was in a cult and began learning about how to open a bank account, how to sign a lease on an apartment, and how to be free. After learning more about how to survive outside the cult, Claire escaped. She now hopes her retelling of her experiences can help other women find a better life. Imagine getting married to this guy who basically you from when you were 15 and then getting told that you're actually going to get married off to some other dude. Meanwhile, you have no idea what a bank account is or like actual real life is. It's so good that she found that book and was able to realize that this isn't how life is supposed to go. I can't imagine how bad things would have got if she had never found it. And finally, number one on this list is Rebecca Stott. Rebecca is once again another story of someone being born into this and just thinking that this is what life is like until finally being told otherwise. List first says, author of In the Days of Rain, A Daughter, A Father, A Cult, Rebecca opens up about her upbringing. She and her families were members of a religious cult, the Exclusive Brethren. In an interview with NPR, Rebecca stated that rules were enforced with intense interrogations about your sins and that punishments would often include isolation that could go on for weeks. Rebecca details the anger she was forced to bottle up and how silent she was forced to be around men. When the cult leader, Jim Taylor Jr., was found sleeping with a young married member, the entire cult ruptured. 8,000 members left the cult, including Rebecca's family. But that did not mean her hardships were over. Rebecca described the overwhelmingness of the outside world world with a sense of vertigo. All the rules of her old life spun around as she took more and more steps away from their binds. It took a very long time for Rebecca to grow less shell-shocked by the world, and to this day she cannot bring herself to open a Bible, which makes a lot of sense. By the time Rebecca was just six, she had undergone at least 3,000 hours of forced Bible study. Being born into something like that must be so hard. I imagine that she's dealt with feelings of inadequacy her whole life. Also getting shoved inside an isolated room for time if you misbehaved is pretty whack, guys, and not something that anybody should want to be a part of. Very glad that Rebecca managed to make it out with her life still left to live. Coming in at number five, Rosemary's Baby. Roman Polanski's masterpiece, Rosemary's Baby, set the standard for many cultist horror movies, particularly in the way it reveals the cult, using a steady and slow build and paranoia, confusing us as to what exactly is even happening. This 1968 horror stars Mia Farrow and chronicles the story of a pregnant woman who suspects that an evil cult wants to take her baby for use in their ritual. Rituals. However, it is quickly revealed that her husband has made a deal with the devil for success in his acting career, and the price is offering up his wife as a surrogate mother for something truly evil. Satan's son. That's right, the cult uses Rosemary as a sacrificial lamb for Satan's grand return through his own offspring, and it is truly terrifying. The general sense of unease throughout the movie is why Rosemary's Baby is an absolute classic and perhaps one of the scarier movies in the horror genre. The horrors depicted on and off the screen aided in the rumor that the film was actually cursed by the cult and summoned demons, with many incidents occurring off screen to the cast and crew, including the slaying of Roman Polanski's wife, Sharon Tate, at the hands of the Manson family. Coming in at number four, VHS 2, Safe Haven. Safe Haven is one of four sections in the 2013 anthology found footage sequel VHS 2, with the segment being directed by Timo Tajanto and Gareth Hugh Evans, and being the best section in the entirety of the movie. The plot follows a news crew composed of four members, who infiltrate an Indonesian cult in the hopes of shooting a documentary about their mysterious activities. Inside the building, they find the walls adorned in bizarre symbols, school children in classrooms, and women dressed in white garments. 
Netherlands. One of the crew, Malik, then overhears that his fiance Lena is pregnant with another crew member's child, Adam. Things then descend into total madness. The deeper the crew go inside the building, with Lena being abducted by several women, with the cult hunting down the crew members for sacrificial reasons. Now, with only 29 minutes to play with, Evans and Tajanto don't hold back, not even for a second, with the segment being insanely action packed and gore filled from start to finish. Not to mention, it builds to an insane, gore soaked climax that will shock the audience cult are successful in their demon summoning, with the beast making its grand appearance towards the final moments of the movie, and it does not disappoint. Coming in at number three, we have Children of the Corn. Children in horror movies are already creepy, but put them in a cult, a cult composed solely of children, then you have a recipe for absolutely terrifying scares. Children of the Corn, based on the book of the same name by Stephen King, is a supernatural folk horror starring Linda Hamilton and Peter Haunton, and is set in a fictitious rural town of Gatlin, Nebraska. The film tells the story of a malevolent entity referred to as He Who Walks Behind the Rose, which entices the town's children to ritually murder all the town's adults and a couple driving across the country to ensure a successful corn harvest. As the couple arrive in the small, seemingly abandoned town, they discover the congregation of children led by a girl named Rachel, with them performing a cultural birthday ritual for Amos by drinking his blood from a pentagram-shaped cut on his body. Amos has turned 19, therefore is considered old enough for his passing, joining their god in the cornfield. Now, while the movie as a whole was a little disappointing, it does deliver on the horrors of cults, not to mention there were seven sequels, with the first being far superior. The cult movie in turn gained a cult following, with it being a hit among movie lovers. Coming in at number two, we have Hereditary. One of two Ari Aster movies on our list, Hereditary was a surprise horror movie, with the reveal of its cult being kept a secret for much of the movie, making it incredibly unexpected when it begins to unfold. Released in 2018, Hereditary is Ari Aster's directorial debut, with it starring Tony Collette and Alex Wolfe as a family haunted by a mysterious presence after the death of their secretive grandmother. However, what begins as a sober family drama very quickly descends into a crazy supernatural horror. What begins as a slow burn quickly catapults into a disturbing horror after an incident involving the family's son and daughter, leaving viewers covering their mouths. As a result of the incident, the mother, Annie, is forced to turn to a support group member, Jones, for support, learning ways she can contact the realm of the supernatural. However, this has devastating consequences, with her awakening something that should never have been awoken. Viewers very quickly learn that a demon-worshipping cult are the true causes of the family's misery and pain. Where still, Ariasta plants Easter eggs throughout the movie as a way of warning us of things to come. However, saying that, most of us may have missed these subliminal messages, but what I can say is, the wall-crawling demon was revealed long before the last 30 minutes of the movie, with the cult being there all along, watching the family and waiting for their moment. The cult in Hereditary are worshippers of Payman, one of Lucifer's most obedient devotees, who rules 200 legions of angels, and is connected to the Tree of Death, hence why the treehouse in Hereditary is so important. The summoning of Payman is gradual throughout the movie, but when he finally arrives and seeks solace in the body of one of the characters, well, it's enough to send shivers down anyone's spine. And finally, coming in at number one, we have Midsummer. There are a few things more terrifying than a cult in horror movies. A group of people devoted to a dark high power who will do absolutely anything to appease the deity. No movie displays this as effectively as Ari Aster's Midsommar. Released in 2019, Midsommar is a folk horror film starring my queen, Florence Pugh, and follows a group of friends who travel to Sweden for a festival that occurs once every 90 years, only to find themselves in the clutches of a pagan cult. Now, unlike Ari Aster's Hereditary, Midsommar lays out its intentions from the very start of the movie. The movie kicks off with Danny discovering the death of both her sister and parents, with the instant putting a strain on Danny's relationship with her already distant boyfriend Christian. Not long after, she learns that Christian has planned a trip to Sweden with his friends to attend a midsummer celebration at an ancestral commune, so the group packs up and heads out. Things very quickly descend into madness, with the group arriving and being met by a large group of white cult members in a very peculiar white outfit with Danny realizing that something isn't quite right here. However, her concerns are proven correct when two commune elders die by senicide via leaping from a clifftop. 
When the male elder survives the fall, the cult mimics his wails of agony and crushes his skull with a mallet. Yeah, things aren't fun in Sweden right now. Now, without ruining much more for those who haven't watched it yet, the cult does what is necessary to summon the dark higher power that they worship, with the American tourist being used as a sacrifice for the demon. Now, more interesting still, while this movie isn't entirely based on a real cult, director Ari Aster does describe it as a stew of sorts. I quote, we're drawing from actual Swedish traditions. We're drawing from Swedish folklore. We're drawing from Norse mythology. All in all, Midsummer successfully draws on the disturbing conventions of cultist horror to generate a sense of dread and unease, making it my favourite folk horror movie and cult horror movie of all time. 